Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of the years 1920 to 45, and in particular the Great Depression. In this final series of lectures on the Depression years, we're going to be looking at popular culture in the Great Depression. And despite the severe economic impact and the emotional toll that the Depression took on Americans, there was still a thriving community of literature, the arts, music, movies, and other forms of popular culture, driven in many ways as Americans sought to escape the overall misery that the Depression wrought on their lives. Popular culture in the 1930s is a study in contrast. On the one hand, the Depression was omnipresent. There was an atmosphere of malaise that hung over many of the works of popular culture. And certainly there are many songs, many films, about which the Depression itself and its many issues, poverty, homelessness, hopelessness, and these sorts of things, are among the core themes. On the other hand, many Americans sought out popular culture as a form of escape. The last thing they wanted to think about when they were watching a movie or singing songs was the Depression itself. And so much of the popular culture of this era is imbued with excitement and happiness and adventure, uh, as if the Depression itself never existed. It's also a decade of great progress in many ways. And so while one might think that the Depression would render Americans uh, incapable of thinking about the future and moving forward, in fact, great progress was made. Just within the film industry itself, we go from the beginning of the decade of the 30s when most films were still black and white and many silent films. By the end of the decade, we are looking at full color uh, talkies, filled with sound and music, and blockbuster extravaganza type films like King Kong and Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz. In the realm of architecture, it's an age of unprecedented forward movement as structures like the Empire State Building, completed in 1931 at 102 stories and built in the most modern Art Deco style, and the Golden Gate Bridge, which took more than four years to build, opening in 1937. It spanned more than 4,000 feet across the San Francisco Bay, at that time the largest suspension bridge in the world. And in fact, the 1939 World's Fair in New York, which was described as the fair of the future, looked to an amazing future that included such new technological marvels as the television. It was an age of great experimentation in the realm of art and also in photography, as we begin to see artists plumbing the possibilities of technology uh, within the realm of art. And yet there was also a strong and pronounced thread of nostalgia in the culture of the 30s. Many Americans called for a simpler time and recalled fondly eras of the past. They feared some of the modern technologies and the modern popular culture that was swirling around them. Some urged a return to a more agrarian way of life, while others prevented the spread of the most modern scientific ideas. It was also an era when Americans craved heroes as they struggled against so many challenges in their life. I've mentioned already in a previous lecture the advent of the Superman comic, who in a metaphorical sense represented FDR himself. But it was an era when uh, heroes thrived in popular culture. And we'll talk about the Lone Ranger. We will revisit characters like Superman and Wonder Woman and others. Americans also craved success stories, particularly the get-rich-quick kind of stories where people much like themselves, who might be down on their luck of very humble backgrounds, suddenly in some form or fashion find their way to fame and riches. These kind of stories particularly played out in the realm of sports, where a number of our greatest sporting heroes of the age themselves lived out this kind of rags-to-riches tale. 
we were drawn to athletes like James Braddock, Cinderella Man, who rose from absolute poverty to become the heavyweight champion of the world. And the unlikely success of the racehorse Seabiscuit, uh, who again had struggled through much of his racing career before finally becoming the most famous and prominent racehorse in the world. In short, popular culture gave Americans an avenue to live out the fantasies and dreams that unfortunately eluded most of them in their actual lives. Certainly the Great Depression had its impact on the realm of entertainment. Those who lived through the Great Depression, of course, recall the hard times and the economic struggles that the Depression wrought. But they also recalled living their lives, trying to achieve some sense of happiness, trying to enjoy themselves despite the economic struggles. I recall talking to my own grandparents about their experiences during the Great Depression. And while I wouldn't say they recalled that time with fondness, there were aspects of it that they did look back with nostalgia. It was a time when many Americans who had little money for things like entertainment entertained themselves in the home. It was a time when families sat together, talked together, sang together, and entertained themselves. And those elements of the Depression, some people who lived through that era recalled with fondness. And so in the realm of entertainment, we have to think, first of all, about things that didn't necessarily cost money, various forms of home entertainment. And again, folks like my grandparents who talk about gathering around the piano, someone would play or a couple of people would play and then the rest would sing songs. Dancing was a popular pastime during the Depression years. Again, it doesn't necessarily cost money. You could dance in your own living room or gather with a small group. Other times, communities would host dances or larger events. And when we think about just going out and dating, these things didn't always involve uh, exp spending extravagant amounts of money. Um, young people would date or double date going to the movies, perhaps going out to eat, or just hanging out with their friends, um, chatting and sharing stories. Now, certainly the most popular form of home entertainment in this era was the radio. Aside from the small purchase price of the radio itself, radio was free. And so families would gather around uh, their radio listening to their favorite programs. Sometimes other groups would come uh, to the home and everyone would listen together. This was the heyday of radio the era before televisions had come on the scene, and again, a time when many Americans couldn't afford to go to the movies or couldn't go often, and so they would gather around the radio. Many of the most popular shows of that era were known as serials. Uh, we might consider them soap operas over the airwaves of the radio because there would be a new episode uh, sometimes each and every day, and people would tune in at the same time and listen as their program slowly wound its way through various storylines. Another popular radio genre at this time was comedy, as comedians like Bob Hope were very popular uh, on the radio. And there were variety shows, uh, much like our current late night talk shows, where uh, comedians might be at the center of it, but there would be musical performances, uh, theatrical performances, and so on. Jack Benny, George Burns, Amos and Andy, uh, Fred Allen, and others were among the most popular comedic performers of that time. Among the most popular comedians was Will Rogers, who appeared in a variety of forms of entertainment in this era and kept Americans laughing with his sharp wit and political satire. Sadly, Rogers was killed at the heights of his popularity in a plane crash in 1935. The most popular radio program of this era was The Lone Ranger, which ran for nearly 3,000 episodes from January 1933 through 1954. The hero of the story is a Texas ranger named Reed, who was pursuing the Butch Cavendish gang uh, when the gang murdered all of Reed's companions, leaving 
read as the quote-unquote Lone Ranger, the Lone Texas Ranger. Reed was befriended by a Native American known as Tonto, and the two of them engaged in a series of adventures to bring justice to the Cavendish gang. Accompanied by his faithful steed, Silver, the Lone Ranger embarked on a seemingly endless series of adventures with Tonto. The Lone Ranger surged to almost instant popularity and spawned a whole array of popular culture spin-offs and related uh, things. There was a Lone Ranger safety club that was created that would send out various uh, goodies and knickknacks to members of the club. At one point, they arranged for a giveaway of pop guns, but almost immediately ran out as there was far more demand than supply. Similarly, they would give out badges and other paraphernalia. Various actors who played the Lone Ranger would make appearances, which drew huge crowds. And the Lone Ranger drew more than 20 million listeners to each episode at its peak of popularity. The Lone Ranger left a, a long legacy, which lingers even to this day, as occasionally there will be television shows or movies, even in the present day. But it spawned various television sh series in the 40s and 50s, and a number of different characters from the show were involved in, in various spin-off projects, such as the Green Hornet, which involved the Lone Ranger's nephew. This is just one example of a program that gave people hope, gave people a hero in the midst of this otherwise depressing time. Another genre that fueled the popularity of radio was sports, which seemed made perfectly to go along with radio, as people all around the country could listen live to very popular sporting events. We're going to talk more uh, in future lectures about sports in particular, but just understand that it was uh, made even more popular by its suitability for a medium like radio. Radio also became very important in spreading news, information, and other kinds of events in the 1930s. FDR famously used radio through his fireside chat to share news and updates with the American people. Similarly, some of his rivals, like Huey Long and Charles Coughlin, were very popular on the radio as well. And there were a number of sensational news events that gripped the nation during this era, who gathered around their radios all across the country, listening as things like the 1937 Hindenburg tragedy played out over the airwaves. As the German airship Hindenburg came in for its landing in New Jersey, the ship caught fire and ultimately went up in a huge ball of flames. As the radio announcer, Herb Morrison, very famously announced, Oh, the humanity! Perhaps even more dramatic, on Halloween Eve, October 30th, 1938, the performer Orson Welles read a dramatic adaptation of The War of the Worlds, the science fiction novel. At the beginning of the broadcast, he made a disclaimer that this was an act of fiction. But many Americans, as they tuned in all around the country, missed that prelude and only tuned in to the actual reading and performance. Actors playing news announcers, officials, and other roles delivered in very realistic and dramatic fashion accounts of Martians and aliens who had landed and were attacking the planet. Americans all across the country ran out into the streets. Others hid in cellars, loaded their guns, and took emergency action. Eventually, of course, the truth was revealed that this was a work of fiction and merely a performance. But thousands of Americans all across the country had behaved as if we were under attack. Dorothy Thompson wrote in the New York Tribune about this episode. She wrote, All unwittingly, Mr. Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater of the Air have made one of the most fascinating and important demonstrations of all time. They have proved that a few effective voices, accompanied by sound effects, can convince masses of people of a totally unreasonable, completely fantastic proposition as to create a nationwide panic. 
A final genre that was very popular on the radio was, of course, music. And the musical scene of the 30s flourished despite the depressing times. Now, some music reflected the sadness of that era. Songs like Brother Can You Spare a Dime, for instance, which were popular. At the same time, though, big band music, jazz and swing, were very popular as Americans sought to dance the Depression away. Big band leaders like Duke Ellington, Benny Goodman, Count Basie, and others were wildly popular. And Louis Armstrong, who I talked about in the 1920s lectures, remained a popular presence on the radio. Many musicals were very popular in that era as well, as writers like Irving Berlin and Richard Rogers were at their peak. But perhaps none of them matched George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, which was released in 1935 in terms of popularity. On the flip side, many people across the country, not just those in the countryside, but even in the cities as well, were drawn to country music and folk singers some of whom were wildly popular at that time. None of them more popular than Woody Guthrie from Oklahoma, who toured the country and performed many songs, particularly those in support of the common man and the labor movement. In the next couple of lectures, we'll continue talking about other forms of popular culture in this era, including the heyday of Hollywood.